Hi, welcome to module six. This is the module where you're going to learn a lot about, or at least something, about using Word as an editing tool. And I know from your first discussion post when you introduced yourself, this was something many of you wanted to learn in the course. So let's do it. All right, I'm going to start by briefly explaining the advantages of on-screen editing. Then I'll guide you through the tutorial that's posted on Canvas, and I'll finish by describing processes for on-screen editing and also recommending some additional resources that you could use to continue building your skills in this area. All right, on to why use on-screen editing. Although I'm going to focus on Microsoft Word, what I have to say applies really to any authoring tool that allows you to edit on a computer screen instead of on paper. Let me start by reminding you of some of the challenges that have been presented in previous lectures. So, for instance, Eaton's research, mentioned in Module 2, found that hundreds of authors they surveyed who worked with tech editors were influenced by three things, and one of them, the first one, the most important one, was the amount of time available to deal with editorial recommendations. That determined whether authors adopted what editors suggested or not. So when there's time pressure on the author, they're less likely to adopt your suggestions. On-screen editing reduces the time it takes to review recommendations. That's one of its major advantages. I also want you to remember the complaints that Lanier, who was working as an editor at a large government research lab, reported. The primary way that Lanier and his fellow editors addressed this poor editor-author relationship was through the adoption of electronic or on-screen editing in Microsoft Word. This was back in 2002. That's nearly 20 years ago. Jeff Hart has been teaching other editors about on-screen editing for decades now. Hart helps us understand the magnitude of errors that are often introduced during the review process in non-traditional publishing. In his book, he says, The typical process requires many review stages that involve many individuals or different job roles within an organization. He gives this example. See these eight listed here. Obviously, that kind of a process ensures the introduction of errors in content before publication. On-screen editing reduces the number of those errors. Nick Nelson at Wordsmith Writing Coaches offered to sell his copy of a program for applying proofreading stamps to PDFs at a loss because, I quote, it doesn't make my life happy the way it promised. <laughs> Instead, he urged editors to use track changes in Word. Although there are other authoring tools that incorporate on-screen editing, we're going to focus on Word because it is nearly universally available within workplaces. On the Intelligent Editing blog, Roberta Gelb, she's a legal writer and editor, reported that every time an employee at a law firm edited a 30-page document that didn't use things like Microsoft Word styles or other smart features like spell checking, it cost the firm more than $80 in wasted time. To summarize, using Word as a tool helps editors reduce the time it takes to edit, which means they can expand the scope of what they find and correct. Tools in Word also reduce errors made by editors and reviewers or authors. The result is higher quality content. The bottom line here is editors working for non-traditional publishers can achieve the same quality in less time. That saves the employer money. Freelance editors can make more money in the same amount of time. Now that you understand the advantages of on-screen editing, especially the use of track changes and styles, Let's move on to the tutorial. As the tutorial instructions tell you, there are several editing techniques available. Choose based on your skill level. If you want to take on all the techniques in the tutorial, go for it. But I know you have a limited amount of time to expand your skills because you have other required assignments during Module 6. The preliminary techniques are best learned for free through the Word Essentials course on LinkedIn Learning. 
if you do not already have advanced word skills. In other words, you don't already know how to set preferences and use styles and track changes, you should start there. I hope you'll have time to complete the tutorials through techniques one through five, but I don't really recommend you spend time this week learning about techniques six and seven. You can do that later. The rest of you might want to begin with technique three or maybe four. I hope you'll complete the tutorial at least through Technique 6 and use Editor's Toolkit Plus. If you have time and want to push yourself, try creating your own macros for editing as I describe in Technique 7. Remember, it's how much you learn rather than where you end up that matters. All right, I'm assuming you've set up, you've got the file, you've turned on the paragraph marks, so let's get started. I'm going to save this. I'm saving it with a new name only because I don't want to ruin the original file that you're going to use. We're going to start by creating headings. So this is fairly simple because the headings are already set up in the styles in the document. So all you have to do is go through, select the text, select the heading level, for this exercise, it doesn't matter which text you select. Once you've done that, gone all the way through the document, you're going to insert a table of contents, which is super easy if you've never done this before. Go to References, click Table of Contents. You'll see you have several options for how that table of contents look. We'll choose this one. And the cursor goes, ah, uh, don't pay attention to the, the page numbers there, because at the end I must have a, an issue with my footer. But as you can see, you've got headings level 1, 2, and 3 with page numbers. One of the things you can do is update the table if you need to when page numbers change. But we're going to go in and choose a different way to make the table. So we, we click on this, you'll see you have lots of options. You can decide how many heading levels you want in your table of contents. We're going to select two. And we're also going to click off the use hyperlinks because we're going to assume this is a print document we're creating. Now this table of contents has only heading level one and two instead of heading level three. This is an incredibly powerful and easy thing to do if you've never done it before. Now, every time you update the document, you can automatically change page numbers. Um, you're going to save this as version one. All right, now it's time to open the original again. and we're going to start using track changes. Turn it on. And the goal here is for you to see what options are available to you. So you're going to look under markup options and then preferences. And you'll see that you have lots of choices in what the markup is going to look like. You can choose colors, you can choose, um, I'm going to choose double underlying blue for, um, for insertions, and I'm going to choose double strike through red for deletions. You can change the color with which format changes appear. You can change the color of comments that appear when you insert them in the margin. I thought about red and then I thought, no, that probably signals something negative. So I went down to green. But you'll see you've got a bunch of different things that you can change here, including the size of the balloons, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So now we're in spell check and we're looking at our options. And I thought I had all of them turned on, but I don't yet. So we're going to click everything pretty much 
You can look at settings. So there are some things that you can choose in options. I think I have them all selected. They're all on. There we go. All right, now it's going to take us through the document and make suggestions. So one of the difficulties here is F1 is the heading that's supposed to be used, but of course that doesn't appear in a dictionary, neither does TXMF. So we're going to click in ignore all. Same with TEL for telephone and DSN for defense, whatever that stands for. Ah, here's one that we can actually change. So it should be than instead of then. Here's another one we have to ignore. Reglazing is a word that doesn't appear in the Microsoft Word, but it's an accurate one for us. Now you see we've got a bunch of acronyms. Oh, here's another F2. So we probably could have done something to make this um, even easier. But what I want you to think about is which of these things are useful to you. And it may be different depending on the kind of document. Now we're going to change something that has to do with GPO style. The GPO, the General Printing Office for the U.S. government. So it, it uses no parentheses. We're going to add a comment. And then we're going to copy and paste See what's in that comment? Edited to conform with the GPO style guide. So a very handy comment. We're going to highlight that and we're going to automate or create an auto text. So we go to the preferences, auto correct, and you'll see there's a tab or a button that says auto text. We're going to choose that. And you'll see in the preview, the words already appear. Now we need to give it a shortcut, what we're actually going to type. What you see here is I've already created one. GPO style. You would click insert. And now we're going to go to a another telephone number. There's one. We're going to make our change, which is to get rid of the parentheses. All right. Now we're going to add our comment. So we click new comment and we start typing. And before we've gotten four or five characters, it gives us the option to just press enter. So there's our comment. This is also a really uh, a great time saver when you make the same comments over and over, which is often the case. All right, we've saved that file. Now let's start on another version of the file. Find and replace is super, super useful. This is done slightly different in Windows, but you're going to go to the find and replace. In Windows, it's a pop-up that appears in on the Mac. It's a sidebar. You're going to click in the find box and type in what you want to find and then in the replace type in what you want to replace you click all you've got 33 instances and with one click they're all changed you can see them in the track changes there we try another one this time let's try replacing sh shall with must ah we've got seven instances and one of the things that I want you to notice here is the second instance is actually the word shallow. We don't want to replace that with must, must owl. So what we need to do is use whole word only. Then we have six instances and they're all replaced at once. All right. Now we're going to try and look at tab characters. So you don't have to type in words in find and replace. You can type in other things. That little carrot and the T is a symbol for tab. We're just going to click the space bar one time because we want to replace those tabs. We made 41 replacements. It got rid of every tab in the entire document with one click. And there you can see how they were deleted. All right, now we're going to try something a little more complicated. 
We go down to Advanced, Find and Replace. Brings a pop-up. Let's look for all the instances of etc. etc. that don't have a punctuation mark. If we ignore punctuation, then we'll be able to find all of them. We're just going to go through. We could replace all, but instead what we're going to do is go through and find one at a time and fix them. So there you see on the screen an ETC with a period. That's good. Here's one ah, that doesn't have a period. So we're going to add one. Another one we're going to add. That one looks good. That one's fine. All right, so we went through and used those. So these search, uh, the ways of refining your search are super important. Here's a, a really handy one. We're going to search format font. Takes a minute to load, but it's going to give us another window, another pop-up. And we're going to go to underline style, and we're going to choose an underline, right? A single underline. So we click OK. Now that's what's in our find what box. Replace box. We're going to choose same thing, format, font. When the box pops up, in this one, we're going to put none for underline style. Now if we replace all underlines with no underlines, you'll see that 45 instances of underlining were removed in a click. Find and replace. Super, super handy for editing. All right, now we're going to spend a few minutes in the shoes of a reviewer. So we're going to turn off track changes for a second. Want to make sure we have all markup, but what if we had no markup? What if the reviewer had their Word software set up not to show markup? They might see this instead of what you want them to see. So sometimes you have to tell authors or reviewers to turn on the things that have to do with track changes. What we're doing here is showing you how you can look at changes differently partly by how you use balloons. So in this case, every change except for an addition or an insertion is shown in a balloon. Now we're showing everything in line. So not in the margins, but actually in the text. So this is where you see my double strike through red for what's been deleted and my double underlined blue for what's been inserted. There are other options too. I personally like to have only the comments and the formatting appear. What we're going to do now is we're going to go through one change at a time as if we were a reviewer and look at them. So, okay, I guess as a reviewer, we're going to have to accept these tab and space changes. All right, we change, or we're going to accept every insertion and deletion of the new abbreviation that's here. So we're going through one at a time. Same here, one at a time. We have to accept them all. All right, now we get to one and we think, no, I don't want that gone. So we have the choice to reject. So one of the things I want you to think about is um, whether it's useful for you to be able to see every change that's happened in a manuscript. There certainly would be times when this would be helpful. What this shows you is there's 90, been 91 insertions and 88 deletions in this file. Not sure an author would care, but I think a, an editor, this might be useful information because it shows you everything, not just the things that are track changes. Now we're going to compare documents. So if we go to our original document, and then in revised, we choose version 3. And we decide we want to label the changes with my name, and we're going to put them either in an original document, the revised one, or a new one. I chose the original. Because there were track changes, I had to accept those changes. And now what you see is not just track changes, but every change. 
that was made. So even if changes weren't tracked, you have, as an editor, a way to compare documents so you can tell what a reviewer has done. All right, now we're going to use Editor's Toolkit Plus. First, we'll set revision tracking. The first tool we're going to use is fix the dashes. Turn hyphens between numbers to end dashes. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. They're not supposed to be hyphens. So you can tell, I hope, that there's a difference in size between the dash and the original hyphen. Super easy. The pull tool. This will tell us if we have unmatched parentheses or brackets. Let's see if we have any parentheses. We do. We have two. So this doesn't fix them, but it tells you you have them. So then you could use find and replace to fix them. You could change title case for all headings in a document with one click. You can track them or not. You can choose whether to do that in headers or footers. Okay, so we changed all of them. We look at one of our headings here and you'll see, yes, it has been changed. All right, we use the Mega Replacer. This is probably the most powerful tool. So you have to create a master list first. When you do this, it's going to bring up this Word file. And it's got examples of, so make all these changes. This would be a list of changes. The spelling to these words, you could add anything you want. I happen to already have one, so I'm not going to save this. You'll Here's the one that I created. We're going to run this and go through one by one and see what changes it makes. All right, so it gives us a little pop-up so we can go to each occurrence. Yes, it changed all those instances, right? Changed those shalls to musts. There's one at the bottom, and now it's looking at et ceteras to see if there need to be if they need to be replaced, here's a U.S. that should have periods, right? So if you have a long list of things that need to be changed, spelling changes, this is a great way to do it. All right, I want to close this lecture and tutorial by saying a little bit about the process for on-screen editing and also make sure you know what resources support your further development in the use of technologies for editing in Word. Developing your own process means keeping in mind your goals are to be more efficient by editing faster and reducing correction time, and then to be more effective by editing more consistently and minimizing errors that come about by incorporating edits. I'm showing you a simplified version of Jack Lyon's process that would be relevant even if you aren't using Editor's Toolkit Plus. So always keep backup files. Make edits that the author has no choice about or isn't likely to care about before you turn on track changes. Track changes and complete the multiple passes that fit the scope of the structural or copy edit you've been hired to complete. Send that file to the author or reviewers and then when you get it back, finalize corrections without tracking changes so the content can be published. As with everything else about editing, there is no single process. I mentioned Paul Beverly's copy editing process in the Module 5 lecture. His workflow is shown in the first column on this table. Like Lyon, Beverly has created a range of macros for use in Word to improve his efficiency and effectiveness. He describes how each stage of his copy editing process can be handled with macros in Word. For instance, he created several allies macros to do things like create a list of what punctuation and spelling conventions an author has used more or less consistently in a document. He runs those before he starts reading and then again at the end when double-checking his work. 
The cool thing is Beverly not only gives away all his macros, he also has produced a free book about them and a multitude of YouTube videos that help fellow editors learn how to use macros in Word. If you want to continue learning how to use Word as an editing tool, check out the sources I've listed in to learn more on Canvas for Module 6. For a concise but complete guide to on-screen editing, check out Waddingham's on-screen editing from 2016, in which you'll hear a little bit about preparing content in XML before publishing. I've also listed where you can find Beverly's macros and other resources, as well as a few more tools similar to EKTP for on-screen editing with Word. I started this lecture by reminding you of the challenges faced by editors and the way on-screen editing overcomes them. Using Word helps editors produce higher quality content by reducing the time it takes to edit, which means they can expand the scope of what they find and correct. I guided you through a tutorial that covered a range of techniques in Word, including a tool called Editor's Toolkit Plus, all designed to help you be more efficient and effective as a copy editor. And I ended this lecture by describing the processes for on-screen editing used by two professionals. I also recommended resources for you. I encourage you to expand your learning in this area. And I want you to know that next week, you're going to learn a little bit about truly cutting edge technology for editing. Good luck. Mm -hmm.